Hello and welcome to uh, the speaker series here at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada. Uh, my name is Eric. I have a slightly slight change in my usual introduction of who I am. I'm no longer a PhD candidate. I just received my PhD. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, but as always, I'm the outreach manager here at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada. Now, before we begin today, um, I would like to acknowledge, as would the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada, that we are located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And we recognize the continuing presence of indigenous peoples and cultures here. The consequences of the long colonial relationship between the government of Canada and First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples are far reaching and painful. And we at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada are committed to reconciliation through the establishment and maintenance of a mutually respectful relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. Uh, before I turn things over to our speaker for this evening, um, I'm sure, you know, those of you that are on our emailing list are very well aware, but in case you aren't, um, our Canadian Military History Colloquium, our annual conference is going to be taking place this year. Um, I think it's the third or fourth or fourth or fifth of May. I can't remember which one, but it's the first weekend in May. Um, this year is also the 100th anniversary of the RCAF, so we're going to be focusing on that theme um, of the RCAF and air warfare over 100 years. Uh, we've got an excellent set of um, uh, papers that have submitted. Um, so for those who are interested in um, seeing the conference, uh, we will let you know when registration is going to happen, but do mark it on your calendars. It's that first weekend in May. Now, this is our last event for this year, and I'm very pleased um, to introduce our speaker tonight because our speaker, uh, his name is Graham Broad. He was actually one of the first university professors that really got me interested in the military history of Canada. It was actually totally by chance. Um, I was at the University of Saskatchewan doing my bachelor's, um, my undergraduate degree, and I remember stumbling across a group called the Canadian Battlefields Foundation and they are going to be doing a battlefield tour as they have done for many years before then. Um, and I thought, ah, oh, I'll throw my hat in the ring, why not? I'm a, you know, hopefully people see me as a promising undergraduate student. Uh, so I did throw my hat in the ring and fortunately I was selected to go to the battlefields of the first and second world wars um, in Europe. And Graham Broad was one of the instructors. I think it was his first time uh, as part of the Canadian Battlefields Foundation as well. Um, in over two weeks, I had a fantastic time. I learned a ton um, from Andrew Iarochi, the other instructor, but of course, uh, Graham Broad. And that, who's, that is who is going to be speaking to you tonight. Graham Broad, he's an associate professor of history at King's University College at the University of Western Ontario and the author of three books on various aspects of Canadian military history, including the recently published Part of Life Itself. You can see copies here at the back of the room. Um, that we'll be selling afterwards. And for those who are tuning in on Zoom, uh, we'll share a discount code with you as well as a link of where you can buy the book. Now, um, again, before I turn things over to, um, to Graham Broad for tonight's remarks, um, I just wanna say for those folks who are tuning in on Zoom, um, you can send a question to us at any point during the talk. Um, please do so. Um, and when you do, let us know where you're coming from. Um, I, I always say this, but I think it's true for everyone here. It's always fun to know where people are coming from, especially if they're coming from, you know, somewhere on the West Coast, somewhere in Alberta, uh, or from somewhere like Saskatoon, where I'm from, uh, wherever it is, it's always a ton of fun to know where people are, are tuning in from. So um, tonight, Dr. Broad, Dr. Graham Broad is going to speak to us about his newest book, Part of Life Itself, on the wartime diary of Leslie Miller. I will turn things over to him to share with you what he has discovered in this diary, um, as well as the process of putting this book together, which was just published a few months ago. Graham. Thank you, Dr. Story. It was me great pleasure to call you that. Eric had great hair. Uh, and, and I... I admire people with great hair. It's uh, ten, 10 years of flowing locks and... Uh, 
This is what happens when you do a PhD, you get less and less as time goes on, Eric. So shout out to some of the 170 people online. I think maybe Megan Hamilton's with us from Australia, a great historian. Um, and I should mention Patricia Sinclair, who's listening right now. You don't know Patricia. Uh, Patricia brought me this project in 2017, around the time of the centenary, and acted as an intermediary between me and the family. Uh, and the project would not exist without her. Um, I want you to have a look at this photo of this guy. This is Les Miller. Uh, then about 27, maybe 28 years old at the time, uh, going for a swim uh, in a rear area behind the front, uh, in a shell hole, actually, uh, looking like he's having the time of his life. It's probably the first time he's been fully immersed in water in a little bit, uh, having a bath in, in conditions that we would probably not consider to be very good bathing uh, circumstances, but he seemed to be having a good time. And he describes in the diary how at, at that moment, one of the official war photographers came along and snapped his photo. And so I undertook uh, to try to find that photo because there were only three official war photographers. And my, my friend, Carla Jean Stokes, who's one of the leading uh, researchers of First World War photography, helped me find it in the Library and Archives of Canada. And I was very proud of myself that I found this photo, only to find out that the family had the photo the whole time. Les Miller's family had it the whole time. And so the version that's on the cover of the book is actually the one that the family had. The version you see here, you'll notice there's a curious line down the middle of it. I couldn't figure out what that line was. Uh, and uh, Carla Jean informs me it was actually a crack on the glass plate photo. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can advance here. Oh, there's an on button. There we go. There we are. You see that crack? That's not real. That's a crack on the glass plate uh, photo. Um, Les Miller, uh, this is no ordinary diary, but Les Miller was not an old, ordinary soldier, and I'm, I'm going to talk about him in some detail tonight. Um, the, uh, and I'm going to put my timer on because I, I do tend, as a professor, to sometimes drive the lecture bus. Um, the, uh, um, this diary, which covered three books, uh, about 400 handwritten pages, uh, covered the entire period from January 1915, uh, when Miller bought it, to March 1919, because Miller was fortunate to survive the war. And in, in it, he recounts in great detail his experiences, especially in 1914. He backtracks a bit, uh, 15, 16, parts of 17, papers off a bit in 18, and then comes roaring back to describe the end of the war in great detail. And in preparing the diary for, for publication and uh, Eric mentioned it is for sale back there. Please buy it. I get about a dollar a copy. <laughs> you see where this is going. Um, early retirement. Um, <laughs> there's six copies back there. Um, the uh, uh, In preparing it for, for publication, I, as some of the reviewers noted, I, I went a little overboard. I added 500 footnotes uh, to try to contextualize the things that Miller who had an enormous intellectual curiosity about the world around him was talking about. And I added about 20,000 words of commentary in the form of an introduction, conclusion, and various commentary uh, throughout the, uh, the work. Um, it's an, you know, it's an interesting question is, uh, we might just need to bring the slide to the front. There we are. Uh, so here we have an actual uh, page of the diary. Um, and Miller did his own illustrations. Not a bad illustrator, actually, through it. This is Bedford House, where there was a British headquarters and a, um, a temporary cemetery that is now one of the bigger uh, Commonwealth War Grave Commission cemeteries in Flanders, uh, a beautiful cemetery. Um, we, we know what is a diary? We, we tend to think of diaries as a form of writing that's private. Uh, that's secretive. You know, we think of, of teenagers writing in diaries and keeping it tucked away from everybody else. And so a source of unfiltered thoughts of the author. Um, but I'd be a little careful about assuming that's always the case. Like any other source, diaries don't, don't come to us pure. Uh, diaries can be, and they're often written with audiences in mind and not just the diarist's future self. Uh, they're written partly for uh, and the expectation that they're going to be shared. 
uh, amongst family and friends. Uh, and Miller's Diary, which I, which I mentioned, covers three books. Uh, at least one of those books was returned home ahead of him. He mailed it home. So he would have had every expectation that people at home would probably be reading it. And of course, he knew he might die. And in that event, he certainly would have known that people would read his diary. And I, I, boy, are they ever now <laughs> reading his diary, I hope. Um, I don't think he had any anticipation that it would eventually be published. Uh, he died in 1979, and I don't think he made any effort to publish it in his own lifetime. Uh, but he would have been aware that others would read it. Um, and in fact, he does refer at one point to the diary as, quote, bearing witness for others uh, of the things he's seeing overseas. Uh, it's also a diary that's remarkably well written. He was a highly educated guy, and he, he wrote with a great deal of eloquence and uh, at times a polish which suggests that um, it, the diary is curated a bit. And I, when, I, when I first read the diary, I had cause to wonder if maybe after the fact he went back and made changes to it. But having, having seen the original, and I worked from a, a transcription the family produced, and then I produced a transcription of my own. Uh, having seen the original, I don't think that's the case. But uh, it's nonetheless the case that clearly some of these passages uh, he gave a lot of thought to. Some of them he clearly wrote down very quickly after events occurred. Uh, in other cases, clearly he, he in his off-duty hours, he thought a lot, uh, maybe even practiced a bit what it was uh, that he wanted to say. So what we have here is a degree, to a degree, I think, self-fashioning uh, image for others, uh, a degree of a performative image for others. Um, there are times where the diary is just strictly matter-of-fact, just quickly recounts what happens in the day. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a passage um, of about six months where he doesn't write much in the diary at all. And I'm not sure why. Maybe he got bored of the routine. Uh, but at the end of the war, boy, he comes roaring back and he describes that critical period at the end of the war and the events in Belgium after the armistice where he's kind of a, becomes maybe one of the first battlefield tourists. <laughs> and he goes and he explores some of the earliest sites uh, at which the war was fought. Um, Leslie Miller, I'll, I'll do a, another photo of him here. There he is. Uh, early photo of him in uniform. Uh, Miller was born in October 1889 in Millican, Ontario, which is essentially Scarborough now. Uh, it was then a rural community uh, and grew up on a farm, like most people in Canada at the time. Uh, and growing up, he developed and he cultivated a lifelong fascination with the natural world. Uh, and in boyhood, he seems to have had a particular fascination with bird watching. And it's difficult to imagine a time when children would be fascinated by bird watching. Uh, but, but he certainly was. And in fact, uh, even as a, an adolescent, he became a regular contributor to a column in the Toronto Globe, which later became the Globe and Mail, uh, called Nature Notes. And uh, all those are digitized now, so you can look up his contributions. Uh, in this particular one, he, he put, a, call, he put a, a letter in Nature Notes asking for help identifying a particular bird that he encountered that he couldn't, he couldn't identify. So even in childhood, he has this great curiosity about the natural world, and he's going to take that overseas with him, as we'll see uh, in a minute. In 1907, um, as he reached his senior year in high school, uh, he actually won a prize that the Nature Notes column had for best, uh, best entry, uh, and he won a prize of $3, uh, which is um, three times more than I get per book. So, uh, so in, 1907, uh, in 1907, that was some serious coin. Um, one of the things that makes Les Miller different from the average rank-and-file Canadian soldier in the First World War is he went to university. This is at a time when maybe 1% of Canadians uh, went to university. And uh, he went to the University of Toronto, a student at Victoria College in the uh, arts program, uh, which would have been a very rigorous uh, program uh, focused on the classics and very language intensive program. And he had very good uh, French and very, very strong German. And there's some evidence that German may have even been spoken in his household because there was some German uh, ancestry. Um, he earned outstanding grades uh, at the University of Toronto. Their archives very 
helpfully furnished me with his grades. He had outstanding, he was an outstanding student. Uh, but he left before finishing his undergraduate degree. The lure of a teaching job uh, out west uh, attracted him. And so we went out west uh, to the normal school, which we'd now call a teacher's college at Stoughton, Saskatchewan. Stoughton, Saskatchewan was a community of about 600 people, uh, still a community of about 600 people. <laughs> uh, and there he became a school principal and teacher. Um, and he was there when the war erupted in August of 1914. A month later, he enlisted. And that's actually surprising too. Um, that first contingent of Canadians who signed up for the, for the war tended to be British born. Um, to such an extent that uh, Terry Kopp, the former director of, of the center here, uh, remarked once that that first contingent was a, was a British army recruited on Canadian soil. I think he was quoting a Montreal politician from the time. It was very much true. But Miller signed up very early, October, for a militia regiment, the Border Horse. Then he transferred to the Canadian Expeditionary Force. You see, the militia stood apart from the CEF. The militia did home front duties. But ambitious young men who want to win the Victoria Cross aren't, aren't winning it in Stoughton, Saskatchewan. So he signed up for the 32nd uh, Battalion, uh, which itself was subsequently broken up for reinforcements, and he became a member of the 5th Battalion. Now, with his, uh, I'll go back to uh, his photo here. With his education and his social standing, he certainly could have gotten an officer's commission. But for some reason, he decided to sign up as a, as a private. Mm. And um, he showed, by the way, no particular interest in promotion until 1918, when he finally did get an officer's commission and was commissioned lieutenant. Um, from the outset, he served in the signals. And I'll show you a picture here of the signalers. Um, this, the signalers were the branch of the service that were responsible for communications. The First World War very much at a technological crossroads. So they're using signaling methods that wouldn't have surprised Napoleon Bonaparte or Julius Caesar for that matter. I mean, they're, they're sending runners, they're using flags and flames and things like that. But there's also new technologies that have been developed in the preceding generation, the telephone, the telegraph, and they're starting to experiment with what they call the wireless, which is radio. And they're only just experimentally using voice with radio. Really what they're talking about is wireless telegraphy, which is wireless Morse code. Okay, so that's what that's his job is to transmit that. But we shouldn't, and by the way, sorry, this is, uh, this is Les here on, on the right. This uh, probably taken in England with the, uh, the 32nd uh, Regiment uh, while they were training in England. Um, he shouldn't be mistaken for a rear echelon soldier. At the battalion level, uh, he's assigned to the headquarters, but headquarters is kind of a grandiose term for what's going on at the battalion level. They, they would have been in a dugout or something when they're at the trenches, well within uh, enemy artillery fire range. And so he would have been exposed to danger. He's, he's not in some chateau far from the action or anything like that. Um, and indeed, uh, Miller at one point recounts the story of his counterparts in the 13th Battalion HQ, who were killed almost to the last man by a direct artillery uh, hit in September of 1916. So he's aware that this could, ha this could happen to him. In addition, um, his job isn't just to pass messages within the battalion or, or to other military units. Um, it's to create and maintain the infrastructure for communications. And so he would have been doing such things as, as an attack is going in, he would have been behind the leading edge of troops uh, running around with telephone wire and telegraph wire to lay down communications. So he's fighting the war with, with those types of implements as opposed to rifles uh, and grenades. Uh, he would have also spent time in forward listening posts, uh, listening in on German communications, trying to tap in the German communications or getting advance notice of a German attack what they called a sap, which was sort of dug horizontally uh, and jutted out precariously in the no man's land. And in addition, uh, headquarters men were often called upon to act as stretcher bearers to bring the wounded back while attacks were still ongoing. Uh, and I want to read you, the first passage I wish to read you tonight is his, uh, as he recounts an action on the 27th of September, 1916, during the battle of uh, Thiepval Ridge. So I have a map. So this is the Somme region of France, where the 
uh, the notorious Battle of the Somme was fought in the summer of 1916, arguably one of the biggest battles in the, in the history of the world. Uh, not arguably, it was one of the biggest battles in the history of the world. This is an Anglo-French offensive uh, fought in the Somme region of France where their, their two armies met astride the Somme River, uh, the Somme River just south of, of the map here. And um, the, uh, uh, the Canadians entered this offensive in uh, September of 1916 uh, and fought a famous battle here at Courcelette, uh, which they liberated. Uh, if you've been to Courcelette, it's um, a little bit bigger than the center here. It's a very, very small dot on the map, uh, but that name seared itself in, in, into the memory of a generation like many other small places that the Canadians fought for at immense uh, loss of life. Um, by the way, in the Battle of the Somme, the, the goal was to go from, uh, from here uh, to there uh, in about two weeks. Um, that's a distance of about 15 kilometers. You can ride it on a bicycle comfortably in about 45 minutes, and I know because I've done it. Um, four and a half months, to, they got half that far for 600,000 casualties, so it's an annihilating war. The Canadians took Courcelette. The problem was is that the Germans were still here on Thiepval Ridge. So no sooner had they taken Courcelette in mid-month and they had to flank to the west behind themselves and go up the ridge to take the Ipfall Ridge. And it's then that uh, Miller's now in the 5th Battalion goes into action. And I want to read you uh, his account of this largely forgotten action. Um, we reached the dugout at 2 a.m. and had a little sleep. On I was on phone duty in the headquarters dugout from 4 to 8 a.m. Our brigade made a bombing attack on the left this morning, cleaning up Zollerin Redoubt and putting some enemy machine guns out of fire. About 9 a.m., we spare headquarters men went out carrying in the wounded. We first got a chap in a shell hole between Zollerin and, uh, I'm not sure if they're on this map, but it'd be right here in this region, um, Zollerin and uh, Hessian trenches. He had shrapnel in the lower back and his legs were paralyzed, but he was patient and as cheerful as a man could be. After we had seen him safely to the dressing station, we returned to battalion headquarters uh, and rested for a while. He goes on. We later heard that Mr. Wilson, our intelligence officer, was up in Hessian Trench seriously wounded. So Pongo, they all have nicknames. So Pongo, Jim Pedley and I volunteered to go get him. We crossed Zollerin Trench under machine gun fire and could not get beyond for Pongo and Jim, as soon as they emerged from the trench with a white flag, were met with a burst of machine gun fire and twice driven back. Just then a high explosive shrapnel shell burst above us and we thought we would end our careers right there. Our scout guide got hit with the driving band on his head. So the driving band is the base of the artillery shell that expands into the rifled groove. Our, our, our scout got hit uh, with a heavy driving band on his head and staggered, groaning, I'm hit. The band fell at his feet and kicked up dust, but it had struck the chap's helmet, a glancing blow, and only dinted the metal. He was quite all right in a minute. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> More shells burst above us, and the German machine gun raked the trench savagely. We worked down to our right and took what cover the parapet afforded. The trench was well manned by our fellows in preparation for a counterattack. Uh, and he goes on to say that they did find their officer. We bound him up using a German shovel as a splint and then went back to headquarters for a stretcher on which we took him out. So yeah, he's a signaler, but he's, he's often exposed to this type of, of mortal danger. And so in writing this diary, he must have been aware of the possibility, perhaps even the probability that he would die and others uh, would read it. A, a few things really struck me as remarkable about this diary as, as I read it. And um, the first was Miller's uh, equanimity, his, his cool mindedness as he writes. He has a kind of detachment even uh, to everything that goes on around him. I, I have it on authority from those who knew him, his, his nephews, Brant and Dan Miller, uh, who also very important in this project, uh, tell me that he was a very fine man uh, Miller had no children of his own. Uh, he was a very fine man, very generous of spirit. But he writes the diary in this almost clinical fashion uh, as he observes things around him. He's eloquent at times, but he, he never gets emotional. He never says why he signed up. 
or what the war meant to him. Maybe he considered it too obvious to even mention, you know, why did most guys sign up? Because their country is at war and it never occurred to them not to sign up, right? Uh, overseas, he takes everything in a very matter-of-fact way. He doesn't, doesn't express any particular animus towards the Germans at any point. Even shows a degree of sympathy in one case when he mentions a terrified young German POW brought in, who he talks to in German. He never says a single harsh word in the entire diary about any fellow soldier, about any rank and file soldier. He grumps a couple of times about officers, but not very often, not very often. There's really only two or three passages in the entire book that betray a hint of anger. And I'd say if you went through that, you'd have cause to be a bit uppity, right? Only two or three times does he betray a hint of anger. Once he refers to an action by the 50th Battalion in June 1917 as a bloody mix-up, nothing but butchery. And that word bloody was considered a very foul swear word at the time, so it's unusual for him to use. And then after the war is over, he's in Belgium at the Mons Cathedral, and there's a great um, um, church service marking the end of the war. And he lashes out at the chaplains the military chaplains. He says, men who have come through years of hell don't want to be told that it's all because of divine providence. We won victory with the help of tanks and yanks and airplanes in the British Navy. The Padres have conspicuously failed in this war, but they'll go back and claim all the glory for themselves and their God in whom nobody believes anymore. Pretty harsh. Pretty harsh. They never touched men. They only thought they did. The soldier's religion is beyond their understanding. But that's really rare. That's really rare. And I'll tell you something else that's interesting. My students are fascinated in the material conditions of soldiering, of the day-to-day, -day, what day-to-day -day life was like in the army. Bad food, getting yelled at all the time, uh, living in the trenches, being cold and drafty and covered in lice and rats and all that. He never grosses about the material conditions of life. And I think a couple of things are going on there. I think part of it is he grew up in the late 19th century. I mean, if you grew up on a farm in Millican, Ontario in the 1890s, you're used to being cold, you know, especially in the winter, uh, used to being cold and drafty. Um, but he, he, he makes no bones about any of this. And, it, and here's actually my favorite passage from the diary. It's the single longest one. I won't read it all. But this is April 1915. Now, he's in England by this point. He's training in England. And he reflects on his life uh, thus far uh, as a soldier. Um, Sunday, April 25th. Our battalion was placed under quarantine for measles. Some people are working really hard to have measles come make a comeback, by the way. Um, our battalion was under a quarantine for measles on Friday, and we did not know yet how long we're to be to confined. We carry on drill, but there's no church parade today. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, most of the fellows played football. So this would have been either rugby or soccer and not Amer American football forward passes doesn't exist yet. I uh, played football or watched the games. Uh, picked teams from A and B companies, uh, played a match. Um, others like myself remained in the barracks and read, uh, read or wrote letters. In the evening, a concert was arranged in our room by 28 occupants. A few from the other platoons came in to take part. Uh, different fellows sang songs such as Commissionaire, The Strand at Nighttime, Pass It Along to Father, and Up I Were the King of England, forgotten songs, you know, largely forgotten songs. About a third of the, belt of the fellows had enough canteen beer to be happy and loose-tongued. There was an abundance of wit and humor and evidence. A few boxing boats were arranged, and I had a turn with the gloves. Finally, we had cocoa, uh, sorry, coffee brought in. We fried onions and sliced mutton in our mess tins over the coal fires and the heaters. I made coca, uh, cocoa and uh, added a few delicacies purchased at the canteen and we had a banquet. Lights out was blown before we'd finish. Uh, but we left and we left things in an indescribable confusion and got into bed as fast as possible. The cleaning up in the morning was a discouraging business, but everyone voted the affair a success. He goes on to say that it's raining, they're under quarantine, uh, they're playing cards, they're chatting, a few of them practicing bayonet with dummy weapons and masks. And he goes on to say, this is such a long way from the life I always lived in Canada. At times, my present experience seems like a dream or an illusion. 
When I consider the food we eat, the lack of comforts we endure, the kind of work we spend our days at, I wonder how we can endure the change. And yet, I can't definitively point to one feature of our life and say, this is a crime and it ought not to be. I've never enjoyed perfect health for so long a period before. <laughs> George Leeson, my chum from Stoughton, who signed up with him, says I've gotten really very fat since enlisting. <laughs> I sleep soundly every night. The blankets seem to give me as much comfort and warmth as, as proper clean sheets and bedclothes. We can keep reasonably clean here as easily as in civilian life. We have all the warm, comfortable clothes we need. We don't get much pay, but we know when payday will come, and a fellow can live quite as usual with no money in his pocket uh, for a week. Um, he goes on to say, Mrs. Stewart, an uh, old friend from out in Stout Stoughton, sent me a lovely box of chocolates, um, which I shared with the boys in the hut. The pe oh, sorry, uh, sorry, it's a person from uh, out east. The people in the maritime provinces are intensely loyal. Such gifts and letters are much appreciated by us. You can get nearer to a soldier's heart with a box of candy or a cake than with all the fine words and polished speeches of praise that could ever be written or spoken. So he's enjoying himself. Now you might think, well, he's in England. He hasn't gotten to the front yet. And that's true. But here's what he writes in December, December 31st, 1915. It's New Year's Eve. And by then he's seen action. He's been under shell fire. And he's in France. Farewell, old year. You have been the most eventful 12 months of my life. From Winnipeg through Shorncliffe to Flanders, no one will ever really know how much I have enjoyed it. Isn't that incredible? Because we tend to think of the war as just being irredeemably awful. And a lot of times it was. But as we also know, a lot of the veterans who got through it um, tended to reflect too on the good times. You know, with time spent with their friends, uh, living life with a high purpose, um, getting up to some pretty rowdy hijinks. You know, you're in your early 20s, you're in France. Ontario's gone dry. Prohibition, right? <laughs> Not France. <laughs> the other thing I found interesting about his diary is he has this intense focus. Um, this is war recorded on an intimate scale. If you go looking through this book for mention of politics back home, the conscription crisis, the American entry into the war, the Russian revolution. He's got nothing to say about those things. Very rarely he mentions something big that happens elsewhere. He mentions when the Lusitania was sunk, but very rarely does he mention something else. He's, he's focused on his own life and the life of his friends around him. On the other hand, um, he, uh, get the slide to advance here. He did keep a detailed list of uh, 47 different flowering plants he encountered uh, in the Somme region that he tucked into the diary by their Latin and common names. <laughs> flowering plants identified in Flanders in 1916. And by the way, this is just April and May. So, um, you know, in many respects, he seems like this kind of bookish uh, intellectual, maybe a bit withdrawn. Uh, much of his time on duty would have consisted of sitting by the telephone or the telegraph, uh, passing messages. And this seems to have afforded him a great deal of time to read. And boy, did he read. Um, he kept lists. I like this about him, so I do this too. He kept lists of all the books he read and he tucked those into the diary too. So here's just a typical page. Now notice that first one. This is a this is a French language book for people learning English, right? L'anglais sans peine, English without English without pain, English without difficulty. <laughs> Why a guy who's fluent in English is reading a French language book about speaking English is I don't know is beyond me. But notice some of the others that he's reading. He's a vast intellectual curiosity. Spanish self-taught, very useful in Flanders. <laughs> Japan, the rise of a modern power. Translations of early Chinese poetry. Frenzied fiction by the great Canadian writer and uh, humorist Stephen Leacock. Weather science, an introduction. <laughs> Weather science, an introduction. Various novels, uh, many of them bestsellers at the time, but largely forgotten today. <laughs> and he finds time 
to discuss the finer points of philosophy and theology uh, with uh, some of the more educated officers. Um, he must have stuck out like a sore thumb over there in amongst the rank and file. It's not that they're un unintelligent, but they're not well educated um, by contemporary standards. Your average rank and file soldier have a few years of, of formal education, maybe a little bit of high school. Many of them were not literate. And here's, here's this guy reading in multiple languages and so forth, and he's one of them. What did they think of him? I don't know what they thought of him, but he thought the world of them. And he made a point of writing about them in the diary. And one of my largest tasks in doing this is I tried to track these people down and find out who they were and what their fates were and give a little bit of information on them. Because I thought if it was important enough for him to mention them, it was important for me to try to follow up on who they were. So I, I, I have brief sort of sentence long biographies of, of about 150 or so people who he mentions in, in the book. Um, and he wanders. I guess you were allowed to do this. He was never found AWOL. In his off-duty hours, when they're not in the trenches, he explores the world around him. Three big battles he records in detail. The St. Eloi Craters, April 16. Montsorel, or Battle of Hill 62, in June. And Thiepval Ridge. And this reminds us, really, of how annihilating the battle was. At the, I, read, I read you the passage from Thiepval Ridge. His battalion had 50% casualties in two days. 50% casualties killed and wounded in two days at the Ipfall Ridge. And yet, even amongst all that, he always finds a way to reflect on what's beautiful, what's delicate in nature, rare birds, flowers and bloom, unfamiliar varieties of trees and shrubs. He has this boundless curiosity of the natural world. And I want to read you the most beautiful passage in the book. It's a bit florid, maybe, but that was the standards of the time. He, he says... At the foot of our hill to the south of our camp, a sluggish stream meanders across flat water-soaked meadow, and on the other side is gathered into a straight ditch and runs leisurely off down into the valley into the south. A quarter of a mile away, it rushes over a steep clay bank to a level lower of about eight feet. It boils up out of its pool, thus formed by the ever-rushing and plunging water, and rambles on merrily, babbling to itself through a little narrow ravine, completely overarched with shrubbery and low trees. This, that's this way. That way's no man's land, right? Isn't that incredible? Um, he says, uh, it's a merry little brook, a brook with a personality that appeals to me. Surely a writer, uh, some writer surely has woven it into a story long before this. It is such a romantic thing. The kind of companion a dreaming youth or a girl with imagination and a love for nature would cherish almost a part of life itself. Hence the title of my book. He spends so many hours strolling in areas, look, checking out birds and flora and fauna, that chatting with locals. He, he always seems to strike up relationship to locals and he speaks their language. Um, that one reviewer of the book said, when did this guy find time to fight the war? <laughs> you know? But he did. It's also interesting to consider him as a kind of tourist of sorts. And there's been a lot of writing about this, about soldiers overseas as tourists. Um, he goes on, on leave to England, and he does the tourist stuff. <laughs> he goes to Madame Tussauds. <laughs> he goes to St. Paul's. He goes to Westminster Abbey. He goes to Scotland. I love his trip to Scotland. He goes to Edinburgh, which is one of my favorite cities. He goes to the Royal Mall at Mile. He goes to Holyrood Palace, tries to find good food in Scotland. <laughs> um, various distilleries. <laughs> various distilleries. And then at the end of the war in Belgium, he becomes a tourist again, uh, seeing some of the battlefields where the first battles of the war were fought. Um, so Miller's diary, to sort of go over the, the rest of it. There he is, commissioned lieutenant. Um, he took a commission in early 1918. He got ambitious, uh, took a commission in early 1918. Uh, and uh, was promoted to signals for the third division rather than at the uh, battalion level. And this required a great deal of training. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, his diary re recounts in, in detail his training in England, his deployment to France in October of 1915, the first shock of battles in 1916, in somewhat less detail, the great events of 17, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then... 
the, the events of late 1918. Along the way, he, he attends lectures uh, by prominent Canadian politicians and speakers, soldiers. Sees Winston Churchill, who comes to address the 5th Battalion when Churchill was briefly on the Western Front. Sees Arthur Curry in the flesh. He seconded briefly to the British Corps of Signalers. And then, as I mentioned, finally, uh, commissioned lieutenant, lieutenant, and transferred to 3rd Division Signals, where he gets working in the new technology, which is wireless telegraphy, radio. And part of his job will be to listen in on German wireless uh, and translate their Morse code from German back into English. So his, his great facility in, in German proves to be a huge asset in that environment. Um, Miller was one of those who was fortunate to survive the war uh, and fortunate to survive it without any major wounds. The family recounts that he, that he lost hearing partly in one ear and, and was left with a limp. Um, and he had occasional bouts of illness and so forth, which are common at the time that landed in the hospital, but no major wounds. And of course, as we know, uh, about a tenth of all Canadians who served in the First World War died in service. Um, probably 15% of those who went overseas were killed or died in service. Tens of thousands of others um, seriously wounded, sometimes uh, for life, uh, blinded, the loss of a limb, et cetera. And of course, we just can't fully measure uh, the number who suffered psychological wounds for the rest of their life, um, about which uh, our colleague Mark Humphreys has, has written uh, a very important book, uh, Weary Road. Um, the uh, um, uh, Miller returned to Canada uh, four years plus or a week or so uh, after he left. Went back to U of T for a bit, uh, outstanding grades, won a major essay prize, uh, an essay prize that Lester B. Pearson later won. Um, went back out, uh, taught a bit out West, married a teacher who he'd met before the war, his beloved Essie in 1926. And then uh, his father's sudden death uh, thrust new uh, responsibilities on him. He never finished at U of T. He may have had to leave U of T because of a bout of scarlet fever as well. Um, but he, he took over a large portion of the family farm operation and ran it for the next 40 years. Uh, he died in 1979. And now I need to talk about Vimy Ridge. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a wonderful photo. This is another one that Carla Jean, I hope Carla Jean's on the call because she helped me find it. Uh, this is third division signals. Uh, that's less uh, our, our bottom left. Um, and um, uh, with the third division signals uh, in taken in Belgium. Uh, and this is actually just after the war, just after the war. Carla Jean helped me find this one too. And uh, the family had it um, yeah. once again. Vimy Ridge, photo credit broad. Uh, that was last. That was last year. I was there with. I uh, was there with a couple of people in this room. In fact, yeah, um, it was a lovely day. Uh, paraphrase Shakespeare as I often do. Um, Vimy Ridge bestrides Canadian military history like a colossus, right? Everything comes back to Vimy, and in large measure because they put this gorgeous memorial there. They might not have. Uh, there were there were seven other candidate sites. It might have gone at Hill 62 or something. And today people would say Canada became a nation at Hill 62. And nobody would have heard of Emmy Ridge. <laughs> it could have happened. Uh, in any case, the, the, the memory of Emmy Ridge has loomed over this project for reasons I'll discuss in a moment. And indeed, in the preface to the book, a very good Canadian writer, uh, Ted Barris, uh, who wrote the preface to the book, devotes a, a significant portion of that preface uh, to talking about Emmy Ridge. Here's what Les Miller says in the diary uh, about Vimy Ridge, the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Uh, where I put these notes since I get there fast. There we are. Sunday, April 15th. Great attack was made last Monday morning, 5.30 a.m., and Vimy Ridge was taken by the Canadians. I was in charge um, of uh, picking up the power buzzer, which is a form of... Uh, uh, telegraph from 4th to 6th Brigades. Next day, I was out over the top carrying in wounded as far as Talis Village. 
It is utterly destroyed by shell fire. It is reported we took 12,000 prisoners and 150 guns from the Huns in this battle. That's it. Not one more word. Sometimes things seem more significant in retrospect than they seem in the moment. And I'm not knocking the, the significance of Vimy. It was an important battle. But Miller at the time, that's all he says about it. I think maybe he was a bit, he was busy that weekend, you know, that, that Monday, <laughs> perhaps. But he doesn't, he certainly doesn't record it the way he records Tiafal Ridge or St. Eloi. So why did Vimy loom over this project? So here I'm going to be a little careful. I'm good for time. According to the story, Miller had returned from Europe, or perhaps mailed ahead of him, a souvenir that befit his interest in the natural world. A bunch of acorns that he gathered on the Western Front, and according to most versions of the story, from Vimy Ridge itself. And he planted them on the family farm, where they grew into oak trees. And he dubbed that woodlot the Vimy Oaks. And in fact, he sort of named the full farm operation the Vimy Oaks. And he would sign his correspondence over the coming decades as being from the Vimy Oaks. Some of those oaks still stand on the property of a Baptist church in Scarborough. And in the lead up to the centenary of Vimy, some people got an idea. There's only, there are either none or one oak tree left at Vimy today because the area was deforested. Wouldn't it be neat if we could take acorns from the Les Miller's tree and plant them back there, right? They call this repatriation, which is maybe a bit of a grand eloquent term for it, but they called it, take them back to Vimy Ridge. The French government had some issues with this. <laughs> Uh, you know how you're just you're not allowed to carry stuff like you know plants and things on planes, but so it took some doing. In the meantime, what they did was they created a very imaginative commemorative project that involved taking descendant saplings from those original oak trees uh, and grafting them to uh, roots. And they have planted more than a thousand of these Vimy oaks across the country. I know that the University of Guelph certainly has them. I think the University of Waterloo has them because one of the people who led the project was a University of Waterloo grad. Um, they're, in, they're at schools and universities across the country. The University of Western Ontario, where I'm a professor, has three. And they eventually did get around to um, planting Vimy oaks in, in France. Now, I'm not an arborist. I don't fully understand the technical details of how this was done. But they did, a, they did get around to doing it. And oh, oh, there's me next to one of them. That's the one next to the visitor center. And there's about 270-ish other ones. They uh, planted about 170 in a forest adjacent the memorial itself. And then the Vimy Foundation has created a new circular centennial park they created for the centennial, called Centennial Park, uh, here. You can see the memorial in the background, right next to the parking lot, and a memorial for French Moroccan troops who also fought in that region that nobody looks at. <laughs> when you're there, please pay homage to our allies. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, and there's the park, uh, planted with about 100 or so of the Vimy Oaks. Now, I wish to clarify two things. The first is that I, I have no connection to this project myself. Okay? I have no connection to this project myself. And second, the diary says nothing at all about acorns. <laughs> the diary says nothing about acorns at any point. So I'm, I'm kind of mute. I'm a bit mute on the topic. Um, nonetheless, the Vimy Oaks loomed over this project as I was working on it because there was great interest in it uh, in the project. Um, and um, uh, a uh, outstanding award-winning book for children on the Vimy Oaks was published around the time I started my work. Um, here, mm -hmm. Vimy Oaks, A Journey 
of Peace. It's a lovely book and, and very deserving of all the awards uh, that it, uh, it uh, received. And it tells a rather fanciful version of the story um, where Les Miller uh, was on Vimy Ridge itself after the battle and found the acorns under a tumbled oak tree and gathered them up and, and brought them home. Uh, and indeed, it's this version of the story that's endorsed by the Vimy Foundation uh, uh, that spearheaded the Memorial Park. And it's apparently uh, based on an anecdote gathered late in uh, Miller's own life. Um, you're familiar with the concept of a, of a holy relic. You're familiar with the concept of a holy relic. You know, this is something that in the church, we've got a, a bit of the bodily remains of a, of a saint or a scrap of their clothing or something like that, uh, of a venerated person. And in the medieval period, huge numbers of people would make pilgrimages to churches to see these, these holy relics. Some parts of the world, they, they still do, right? It's very important. The bigger the church, the, the more important the relic. Amiens Cathedral in France, they have the head of St. John the Baptist. Yeah. The church of St. Of, uh, San Silvestre in Rome, they have the head of St. John the Baptist. <laughs> and the modern historical mind goes, wait a minute. <laughs> How can there be two heads of St. John the Baptist? <laughs> I mean, he performed miracles and all, but. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that uh, relics aren't meant to be exposed to the modern scientific historiographical mind, right? They're, they're objects of faith and veneration. And I think the Vimy Oaks project needs to be seen in the same sort of fashion. Did Les Miller actually get the acorns from Vimy Ridge? I don't know. I think it's possible that he, that he did. He was very punctilious, as you saw, about the details of getting things right in the natural world. It's, it's possible that he did. Uh, did he gather them up from a fallen tree? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, no one in the family remembers him telling that version of the story. But he did call that woodlot the Vimy Oaks, and he was very pectilious about getting his facts right about the natural world. So I think it's possible that they actually did come from Vimy Ridge. But I also think that it actually doesn't really matter that much because I think it's actually a very touching, a very moving, and very appropriate memorial. It's a memorial of a different kind that I think is very befitting Les Miller. Uh, Les never went back uh, to Europe. He never went back to the cemeteries that I've been in where some of the comrades, dear friends of his, lay buried. Um, and I've been to some of their graves. He never, he never had the chance to go back there and see those. Uh, he never got a chance to see the Vimy Memorial or the memorial at Hill 62 where he fought. Um, and so I like this idea that what we have here is a living memorial, uh, a bridge between those who returned and those who did not, uh, because I think it's, that's part of life itself too. Thank you very much. Well, Graham, thanks so much for a wonderful talk. The last time you were here, you uh, spoke about Eddie McKay and the mm -hmm. book that you published. Um, the stories you tell are just so intimate and personal. Um, and I just, I enjoy them gen genuinely. I really enjoy them every time you come to speak about them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, I want to start off um, just letting folks know we're going to, you know, go as we always do from live audience to Zoom uh, back and forth, and I'll, I'll vocalize the questions from Zoom. Um, but I'm going to step in, uh, host prerogative, and ask the first question. Um, Graham, I may even do two because uh, we got lots of time. Yeah. Um, I was struck when I saw the, the photos that you showed of him when right at the beginning of the war. He's a very young man. Mm -hmm. At the end of the war, he looks quite a bit yeah. older. Um, and you noted how, you know, throughout the diary, he didn't seem to mention, um, you know, feeling overwhelmed, th feeling distraught, angry. But could you detect when reading through the lines if there were points where you could feel that maybe the emotions were starting to come up, you know, stresses, anxieties, um, perhaps even traumas? that just didn't make it onto the page there's um there's one moment in particular where you can sense a kind of anguish um and it's a very grisly one the um 
Maple Cops is a um, uh, was an aid station with a cemetery attached to it, as they they tended to be um, in in the. Uh, um, I'm going to be in trouble in a second. Someone, someone online is going to correct me, but in, in the Somme region. And uh, we've been there. So you think I would know whether it was Somme or Flanders, but anyway. Uh, and there's now a Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery there. Most of, the, most of the existing military cemeteries used to be field hospitals, hence the reason there's a cemetery. Maple Cops, the, the field hospital and cemetery got hit by German artillery and all the bodies were forcibly disinterred by explosions. And Miller uh, witnessed the, the site. Uh, and he records it as being, he, he says simply, it's the worst site I've, I've ever seen, and he says no more. And that's unusual for him. Normally, he, he's so cool, he so clinically describes everything in great detail, he, he, he said no more about that, that horrific site. And when you go to the Maple Cop Cemetery today, um, all of the graves... They have people's names, but it, it adds, there's a disclaimer that says believed to be. In other words, when they reinterred everyone, they couldn't be certain who, the, who exactly they were reinterring. They just knew that they were in the cemetery. So yeah, he does feel that. And yes, he, the war ages him. You, you see that. And that was not uncommon, that the physical impact of, of the war on people. It's a real thing. Hair goes white. People look older. Uh, even in even in the relatively short, there's maybe three and a half years between those pictures, three years between those pictures. Um, I'm just going to jump in one more time, and then I promise I'll go to the audience. Um, you mentioned kind of a performative aspect to the the diary. Um, I'm curious if you know you were able to kind of poke some holes into that performative nature, maybe in looking at his service file. Um, I know that we. There's often very little in them, and that yeah. could very well be the case for less. But I'm curious if there were times where you could see that it was very clear that he was performing to some degree, um, and perhaps something more, you know, traumatic, troubling was happening that you saw in his service file. It's a good question. I don't. I don't think so. He um, he's in the hospital. Uh, a couple more times than he talks about in the diary, uh, but usually just for some kind of ill-defined camp disease or something like that. Um, there was an interesting thing in his diary um, that actually caused some confusion in, in the family. Uh, sorry, not in his diary, in, with the uh, service file that caused some confusion of his, of his family. Uh, and that took me a couple hours to figure it out too. Um, there's there's a medical file in, in his service file that says uh, that he was wounded uh, by gunfire and that he was in the hospital for quite some time. But the diary nowhere mentions this, and I, I thought this maybe explained the six-month absence. And as I got looking, I realized that it wasn't actually Miller. It, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't our Miller. It wasn't Leslie H. Miller. It was Leslie R. Miller, not of the, not of the 5th Battalion, but the 5th Canadian Mounted Rifles. So what you have here is First World War record keeping, right? You have some clerk, Miller, right? Put in the wrong file. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it's the wrong guy. So you know, warning to all grad students, uh, but, but you know that to, to look out for that. And so I actually told the Library and Archives of Canada about it. And they said that they will get on that in the next 30 or 40 years. So... <laughs> <laughs> they're <laughs> they're cash they are cash strapped but yeah. <laughs> all right let's turn it over to the audience uh question in the back i'm going to hand you the microphone so just hold your question for just a second do you think or would you guess that his reading and writing was really a way of dissociating himself from the slaughter that was going on around him yeah, I th I think maybe, and there's there's been quite a bit of written about that. The soldier as novelist, right? the soldier as poet. But these uh, Tim Cook's written about this very well. Um, that this these were these became coping mechanisms. Everybody had one. Uh, Miller had this pre-existing skill set, uh, and so the ability to to go out and study flora and fauna for a couple of hours uh, and get away from from the horrors of war. 
uh, to, to write in his diary, I, I think probably was a powerful coping mechanism for him. Because again, it's strange that he doesn't, except in one or two places, doesn't really betray much emotion. Uh, so I think, I think that's very probable. Um, question from Norma Graham. Hi, Norma. Um, did you get a sense of his meeting with Curry at all? Did he speak about it? Or I, yeah, I'm going to be... Um, can't remember my own book. Uh, actually, that part of it's his book. Um, yeah, no, he didn't actually meet. He didn't actually meet Curry. There was a review. the The battalion was reviewed, um, and I think he just mentions him in passing. He doesn't really say any, any sort of description of him or anything like that. Yeah, uh, but it was good enough that we decided to put a picture of Curry in the book. Yeah, <laughs> so a photograph of him. Yeah. Um, I'll, uh, I'll vocalize another question here from Zoom and then I'll bring it back to the audience here in the room. Um, speaking about the diaries themselves as primary sources, Graham, uh, Nathan Hiller asks, were the diaries viewed by many people before your involvement? A good question. So the, uh, the diaries remained in, in Les's own possession. I don't know how many people he shared them with uh, until his death in 1979. Uh, he had a younger brother to whom he was quite close, uh, Carmen, and uh, Carmen actually went on to get a PhD in mathematics, I think, University of Toronto. He's also a highly educated guy. Carmen um, had inherited the diary, and then it subsequently went into the possession of his of his nephews and then their children. And so there's there is there was a sort of whole family effort around the diary, and they made some efforts of their own to transcribe it. And they actually did a very good transcription. I just mine mine differs in terms of I kept his original spelling intact and things. Um, so yeah, I, I think certainly within the family, a great, a great many people read it. Yeah. But beyond that, I'm not, in, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, question in the room. Yeah. Hold on for one second. I got a big loud voice. No, no, you gotta have it. Uh, the people on the people online need the mic. Yeah. Is it on now? Um, my question is coming from maybe a more modern perspective. Maybe it's entirely relevant, but it seems odd to me that this, it, I personally regard the first world war as a, as a, bloodbath, an appalling loss of life, one of the last of mil imperial wars that was ready that should never have happened. Uh, you said this gentleman, Mr. Miller, was a very learned, curious, intelligent man. Is there any evidence in his diary or elsewhere that he ever reflected on the morality or purpose or value of the war? I mean, from my perspective, if I'd been in a trench and somebody had said over the top, I'd rather be shot than do that. I mean, yeah. it was a bloodbath. So yeah. it seems odd that you never, unless this whole bit, thing was a distraction, as you indicated, but it seems odd that you never, never reflected on, was it perhaps also related to the fact he didn't have that much combat experience or direct? So scholars have, in the last generation, have tied themselves in knots over this question of, of how the generation that fought the war understood the war. And of course, there, there have been those who, particularly those who focused on the cultural heritage of the war, have really focused on the idea that that the war was a period of despair and 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 needless suffering and and so on. Others have looked at more the the commemorative practices after the war, and they and they've seen uh, the language that we use on Remembrance Day, right? That it was a great struggle to save democracy and and so on. Um, and the argument being that the, the generation that fought the war really couldn't have lived with themselves if, if they'd succumbed to despair. And so there's this argument back and forth over which view is true, and, and, and it's really not necessary to tie yourself in, in knots over it. It's both, both are true. Uh, these, these two things can reside next to one another uneasily. Miller never says a bad thing about the war. It's, in, it's astonishing. And it, it could be because he's aware of the possibility that he could be being surveilled, right? That he could die and he might be held in disrepute if he said something bad or whatever. But at no point does he ever question the, the political cause. He, he never even discusses the, the cause at all. Yeah. Just a quick follow up. I mean, yeah. my viewpoint. Yeah. It seems to me that, you know, once you get past the original, the early days, you know, king and country stuff and rah, 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 the flag, that, after three or four years, you would be to think, wow, I mean, there are a lot of dead people. Yeah. We've maybe gained 20 miles of territory. What are we doing this for? England's not going to be invaded. Like, what? Canada's not going to be invaded. Why are we? What's and the some, purpose? And some people felt that way, right? Wilfred Owen being the most famous example. If you could see what I see, 
you would never again tell the old lie that it's sweet and fitting to die for one's country. But there were, you know, as Jonathan Vance and others have argued, there's lots of lots of people, including combat soldiers, who who felt great pride about about their service and felt that it that it had been a, a civilizational struggle that had been worth it. I would make the distinction between First World War, Second World War was a totally different kettle of fish. Sure. So the First World War was not your biggest kettle. I'm with you, by the way, but but again, I, I as a historian. Yes. I have to take people's views at the time on their own terms, right? Um, I got another question for you, Graham. Um, so you've done two micro history projects back to back now. Is this um, is this your question to me? Yes. This oh, okay. Is mine. This I was is just mine. wondering who's asking me about micro history. But <laughs> no, yeah, this is my go. own. This yeah. is my own. Yeah. Um, you know, we've become very attached to our historical subjects in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Um, but the source bases are so different between Eddie McKay and yeah. Les Miller, right? Like you have a man who is, um, you know, speaking intimately day to day in the case of Les Miller. And in the case of Eddie McKay, you are really piecing together tall, really tiny fragments of information mm -hmm. about his mm -hmm. life. Um, do you have a, again, speaking to, you know, we get attached to these historical subjects. Do you have a sense of, which man you liked more? You didn't get me in trouble, Alex. <laughs> um, okay, so in in 2017, I, I uh, beginning of 2018, mm. I published a, a biography of sorts of a a Londoner, a Western a Western University student named Eddie McKay, who became one of the first Canadians to serve as a pilot in the in the First World War. He died overseas. Very different process because McKay didn't leave a diary, for example. There's fragments that I had to piece together. Um, and Eric's heard me talk about him at McKay's marker overseas, actually. Um, the uh, And by the way, I beta tested that book here as well in 2018. <laughs> so this is, seems to be where I do it. Um, who did I like better? I, you know, I had such a robust source material for Miller and I can't help but admire his intellect and so forth, but I, I could never quite warm up to him. Um, and I think that's by design. I, I think his, his diary is clinical. It is detached, perhaps as a, as a coping mechanism. Again, from what I hear from people, he was a very, a man of, of great generous spirit and so on. But uh, I didn't, I never warmed up to him quite the way I did with Eddie, who seemed a bit more of a reckless, brazen, troublemaking, bit foul mouthed uh, athlete who decided to become a, one of the first generation of fighter pilots. Um, yeah, that's my answer. And, I, and I'm going to apologize to Patricia, who's listening to this right now, and who brought me the diary. But uh, I'm sure Les was, again, he was, it's an extraordinary diary. There aren't many like it, uh, but that's just me. Yeah. 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 Did you, there, there's a question from Sarah Hart coming from, uh, from Ottawa. Hey, Sarah. Um, and she's asking you if you could kind of compare the logbook, which is the primary, one of the primary sources you use for Mac, the McKay project. Yeah. And compare that to the diary. Um, you know, differences, similarities, um, how you use them, again, similarities and differences between the two. Well, the logbook is, um, so I, I had Eddie McKay's logbook, uh, which was very fortunate. The family had it and, and gave it to me. Uh, the logbook is much more matter of fact. Uh, it gives me the technical details of his flying, but glimpses at his personality um, as he writes small comments such as, I lost my engine, oh, sorry, and, sorry, propeller came off at 12,000 feet. Plane does not fly so good without engine. That was one of his comments. So that, that, gives, me, that gives me a sense of the man, right? It gives me a sense of the man. Um, Miller, Miller has 400 handwritten pages, 60, 65,000 words uh, of commentary. So you get a much fuller sense uh, of the person. Um, uh, you know, but having said that, as we know as historians, more documentation isn't always better, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, there and there are different processes. I, I think I had to be somewhat more imaginative with the McKay project, which you know opens up all kinds of interesting methodological questions. And yeah. Well, and you know, speaking to the kind of the volume of the First World War records, you know, do good the original historian of the first world war the official historian never was able to finish writing because 
Sure. You just got drowned in the documents. Yeah, I actually recently went to an excellent public talk by uh, really one of my mentors, Neville Thompson. He wrote a fantastic book about Mackenzie King and his relationship with uh, FDR and Roosevelt. And he pointed out that nobody's ever actually, no academic has done a full-blown biography of King because nobody wants to face it. Uh, because there's there's a, a diary with over a million words. Uh, nobody can nobody can face it. So it's a project for you. Yeah. Well, and you, you add on to that hundreds and hundreds of meters of personal correspondence. Sure, yeah. Right? Like it's yeah. it's a gargantuan task. Um, and so you know this is always the problem for historians of modernity that my wife's a medievalist and um, their problem is they have too few sources. Our problem is we have too many. And so either way, we just have to make it too few. We have to filter it down, right, to a manageable size. Yeah. You know, lots of questions in the room here. Let's start with the gentleman here, and then I'll give it to Rich afterwards. Do you know when he was in the course of battle, uh, any sense of where he would have kept the diary or would it have been with him all the time? That's interesting. He never he never says where it is. Um, it was physically very small. Um, he may have kept it on his person. I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, probably just back in his in his in his bunk or wherever they were. Um, he would have had to be careful with it because they're they're moving around quite a bit uh, and they're constantly billeted or quartered somewhere differently. But I'm not entirely sure where he kept it. I do know that he 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 mailed the first one for sure home. And he actually notes in the diary that he's that he's doing that at one point. Yeah. Hey, Graham, uh, close your eyes for five seconds. Yes. <laughs> Through that door, Les Miller walks in. You've got five minutes, and apart from acorns, what would you ask him? I was going to ask. I was going to ask him about the acorns. <laughs> I want to know. Okay, Les. You got to give me an honest answer. What did the other guys think of you? Because he's, again, your average rank and file soldier in the First World War just did not have very much education. And this guy's out here reading poetry of ancient China and, and, and polylingual polymath uh, who's arguing theology with one of the regimental colonels. And talking about Rupert Brooks' po famous poem, The Soldier, and whether or not we're a pulse in the eternal mind, that famous line from the poem. Um, that's a very different sort of guy than, than your average Canadian soldier in the First World War. So I want to know what they thought of him, if he could be honest with it. He liked them. You know? Yeah. So what a question. <laughs> Is there another question in the audience here? I have a few, but I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah. Professor Spooner. Thanks for the talk, Graham. It was it was really, really good. Um, I, a couple of questions, I guess. One is, how atypical would this diary have been? My sense is that you're saying that there's, you know, I know soldiers kept diaries, but this sounds pretty spectacularly yeah. unique in terms of its length, its depth of reflection. So that would be one question. The second question I had is about the sending the one volume home. So correct me if i'm wrong but i'm assuming this would have gone through sensors okay. right and so you know would there have also been an element of him knowing that what he's sending home is yeah i'm i'm, I'm guessing that i don't know that for certain but would would that have been the case so do you think that might have also influenced what he wrote or how he wrote or uh okay so in reverse order the the second one's oddly enough, it's a question that didn't occur to me until it was too late to, to include it in the book. I don't know if the diary would have gone through a censor, just given the length of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is Tim Cook online? Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I, I do know that, I mean, the mail was censored, but not always consistently. And it's sometimes remarkable what makes it home. And especially if you read small town newspapers where there's really not any oversight, you'll sometimes read, they'll publish in full people's letters from overseas that are often very graphic depictions of what the war's like. Um, 
your first your first question about the diary itself somebody about 20 years ago put together a, a very strange little book which i think they self-published it was essentially just a bibliography of known canadian diaries of the first world war and i think there are about 1400 and that may sound like a lot but when you consider 620,000 served so you have about 1400 and um a lot of them only exist as fragments a lot of them are very matter of fact and so forth. So it's rare to find one of this detail covering the scope of the war and of this eloquence. It's very rare. Uh, again, it does fall off a bit later, but then it, it comes back. So I, that's what immediately attracted me to this project was this, it is an unusual diary. Yeah. Um, a question from uh, Pat Dennis, actually. Well, um, does Pat know the answer to the question? <laughs> <laughs> And hey. can he answer it in, in under a thousand words? <laughs> <laughs> Pat knows I'm kidding. Pat, it's good. Uh, good you're tuning in. Hey, Pat. Um, did you ever get any sense or any evidence that he engaged with the Legion or comrades, veterans at all in his post-war life? Uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um I, yeah, Pat, I just, I can't answer the question. I don't know. I know he never went back overseas. He didn't go on the Vimy pilgrimage or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I just, I just don't know. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if he did. He, he was uh, an inveterate uh, letter writer. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if he did keep in contact with quite a few people. Uh, engage with the Legion specifically, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, question to Allie in the audience. At the beginning of the talk, you showed us some um, um, an example of art from the diary. Um, how frequent were um, kind of his sketches and drawings, and were they always just kind of how he expresses nature in the diary, or did it ever show some like grim reality? Uh, there's maybe just guessing off the top of my head, maybe two dozen illustrations in the diary. They tend to just be of the physical environment around him. Uh, he sometimes draws the terrain, uh, geographical features um huts that they're living in and that sort of thing he does a couple of maps um of their immediate vicinity uh but none of any people or anything like that um he does do a good one uh in flanders of the uh of the battlefield um the uh, so presumably from very close to the, or at the front um but yeah none of any people or anything Um, Graham, a part of this project is working with the family that had the diary. Um, could you talk about, you know, that process of working with family? You know, it's the First World War. It's, you know, the last veteran of the First World War died in 2010. Um, and so living history isn't there, but descendants history yeah. is there, right? And there's a book, an excellent book by Mike Roper um, in England, uh, just published a book on, you know, descendants history and the long legacies of the war. Um, clearly, this was an important diary to the family, to the descendants. Cause, so could you speak about, you know, doing descendants history and, you know, community engaged history in which we are increasingly doing as Canadian historians? Uh, yeah, it's living memory is a valuable thing uh, but our memories can also be frail and this is always the problem with you know over the years i've been teaching 20 years now but over the years i've had students say i'm, I'm going to interview granddad or great granddad who was in the war or something and part of the problem is is just for any of us our, our memories aren't that reliable over decades but especially when we get into your 90s and so forth they can become highly unreliable I'll give you an example. My wife's grandfather's Royal Navy, Second World War, on a troop ship. Until Jim was in his late 80s, um, had every detail down. And that started to fade as he got into his 90s. And by the time he actually died right before COVID, age 99, D-Day veteran, by the way, uh, Jim um, uh, told me about the time that Churchill and Roosevelt came aboard the ship for a summit meeting. Okay, so that didn't happen. That didn't happen. That's that was something that occurred in his in his imagination. The with working with families, um, 
they were very they were very important uh, to be able to contact the two nephews and then Patricia Sinclair, I mentioned before, sort of acted as an intermediary through the project. And um, to be perfectly frank, she knows the diary better than I do. Um, she, uh, they were very, very important in, in helping me fix details, explaining who certain people were, that, that sort of thing. Where you can sometimes have a problem is that one's duties as a, as a modern scientific historian can sometimes clash with cherished memories. Uh, can sometimes clash with uh, what people want to hear as opposed to what's historically true. And, and tensions can sometimes emerge there. And we see this all the time, right? We see it in, in clashes between war museums and veterans groups, for example, um, between you know, what historians are obligated to do and what patriotic people want, wish to hear. You see what I mean? Those things can collide. And that can sometimes happen in a, in a project like this where you're working with family. But on the whole, our relations were were very were very positive. And again, I, I could not have done the project without them. It just not and not just because they brought me the diary, but because they were invaluable throughout the entire the entire process. Um, I'm just going to ask one last question, and I think we'll wrap things up. Um, back to this micro history question, Megan Hamilton asked um, about hey, it. Um, you know, what are the value? What is the value of doing micro history? Um, it, it's kind of, to me, it's, I don't know, a bit strange. And I don't know if you feel this too, but in an age where we do have done social history for, you know, 40 years, even yeah. longer, um, micro history is not a particularly popular approach, um, at the granular level of the two books that you have published. Um, so I wonder if you could speak some more about, again, the value of micro history, the limitations, the strengths of it, um, and why we don't see more of it. My my first book was based on my dissertation, and it was a sweeping social cultural history of Canada in the Second World War. And so the critics come along and they go, "Oh, this is great, but you you didn't mention this particular group of people that I'm interested in this particular town in Saskatchewan." <sighs> um, and then you write, you say, "Okay, I'm going to write a book about that." And somebody else comes along, probably Jack Granistein, and goes. <laughs> What happened to the great national narrative? You know, so you can't win. So that's a little grievance I clearly have. So, um, but, uh, so micro history, what are we talking about? Um, in the 1970s, a very important historian named Arlo Ginsberg wrote a book called The Cheese and the Worms. And it was about this uh, guy in the 17th century got tried by the Inquisition and he had basically his own religion. He had developed this fantastical religion and uh, Miller looked at, at this trial to, and they, they burned him at the stake okay, for having his own religion. Miller looked at it at a granular level. And what's the point? The point is, if this one guy who we only found out about by accident had his own religion, what did everybody else believe? We only know what the church was teaching. We don't know what was received on the ground. So that's where microhistory can be important. So you, by microhistory, we take a very focused look at one person. So I take a, I very, take a very focused look at one pilot, for example. And I find out, you know, his training was actually very different than what the general conclusions that people make about training. His experiences in aerial combat were very different than the general conclusions. So I'm not saying the general conclusions are wrong, but I'm saying that this one case can show an exception to larger patterns and, and therefore be highly suggestive. I guess that's, I guess that's the, the, where microhistory can be very valuable. Where the, where the danger is, is that you get too focused on that granular level. You, you, can, you can miss the, the big picture that's real. Um, yeah. I could take, take my methods course. Was that Megan? Was that Megan's question? That was a great question. And, um, yeah, it's a great. That's, that's, I, I could go on about for some time about this, but it's that's a great that's a great question. Well, let's give uh, Graham Brad one more round of applause. Um, I I forgot to uh, to thank my host today. Uh, the center uh, for many years um, has been important in my career. Um, it's it's been a leading center initially in Canadian military history and now in in uh, for the study of, of of Canada generally, 
Uh, they've been very great hosts to me today and many times in the past, and of course, supported this book tour its publication. And so thank you all for supporting the center in turn. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, before I let folks go, just a reminder, uh, for those in the room, we do have uh, a part of life itself for sale. You won't find it any cheaper, so please do purchase a copy if you want to learn more about those micro histories that Dr. Broad has written. Uh, for those on Zoom, uh, we'll share a link with you as well as a discount code once one more time um, for you to use if you want to purchase one uh, through the University of Toronto Press. Um, one more reminder. Canadian Military History Colloquium, first week of May. Uh, we'll let you know very soon that when registration uh, will take place. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for your support over this year. It's always fantastic to see people here in the room, but also for the many folks tuning in on Zoom um, across Canada and even across the world. We had one fellow tuning in from California tonight, which was pretty cool to see. Um, but yeah, thanks again. Have a great night and we'll see you soon. <laughs>